In this video we're going to look at how to use Monte Carlo simulation to understand a peak model and its stability with respect to noise. When we construct a peak model we define a set of fitting parameters that are position, foot, half maximum and area and we may introduce constraints between these parameters that will guide a peak model. We also use different line shapes and these line shapes also represent a shape constraint on how data are fitted. We have to choose the number of components and then we have to fit these components to the data using a, an optimization routine. Now the idea of the optimization routine is that it determines the position for the half maximum and area so these components reproduce the data with the greatest precision possible. And when we perform optimization there may be local minima that are deep or they may be shallow and depending on the nature of these minima then the peak model will either be stable with respect to noise so if we give a perturbation to the peak model as a result of the noise in the data then the peaks will return to this local minimum. If it's unstable with respect to noise then any perturbation in the noise may cause a dramatic change in the ratio of these peaks. So what we would like to do is have a a means of testing a peak model against noise and make sure that when we've constructed the peak model in terms of these parameters and the parameter constraints then we obtain a sufficiently deep local minimum that if we apply this peak model to different spectra that have different noise characteristics but the same general envelope then the peak model will return reasonable and consistent answers. And This is what I mean by stability with respect to noise. I can illustrate the functioning of Monte Carlo simulation using these three different peak models. The only differences in these peak models, certainly between the first two, are the line shapes. So the first one is a void function for each of these line shapes. There's a generalized void function here actually representing the orange peak. But they are essentially calculations based on the integral of a Lorentzian-like shape with a Gaussian. The pseudo void function SGL is a closed form calculation for a peak shape that is supposed to model a void function but it's not a true void function and similarly we have a product form for the GL line shape and this is a product of a Gaussian with a Lorentzian. They all produce very similar results in terms of fitting of these data the one difference in addition to the line shapes that differs between these three peak models is that the product Gaussian Lorentzian is making use of an offset Shirley background and this is because of the shape of the GL line shape. It won't allow the same background produce the quality of fit that is possible for a sum and the Voigt function data reproduction is identical. So what we'll do now is test these peak models using Monte Carlo. Now one way of doing this is to use the Monte Carlo button on each and every one of these spectra in turn. And this will create a simulation and it will also create a report that will allow you to understand the simulation. However what we will do in this case is we'll use an option that will allow the calculation of these uncertainties for each of these VAMAS blocks that are selected in the right hand side and displayed in these display tiles. And this is performed using the browser operations. So if I right click over one of these spectra, then looking at the propagate options, I clear all the propagate options other than the component error bar calculation. We're calculating the uncertainty that will be displayed here in these annotation tables once the Monte Carlo is finished. So the Monte Carlo calculation will be performed for each of these VAMAS blocks that are selected and you can see in this list the VAMAS blocks that the Monte Carlo will be applied to and these correspond to the selection in the right hand side. So once I'm happy that I've selected everything in the correct way for calculating an error bar I press the OK button. Once the Monte Carlo is completed, each one of these annotation tables indicates the uncertainty that has been calculated for these specific 
peak models. So in the case of the Voigt function, we end up with a reasonably good standard deviation in the sense that it's small and it's uniform across each one of these peaks. Now by comparison, we've got two other peak models for which the uncertainty, certainly amongst these correlated peaks, is quite significant. You can see also that the isolated peak for each one of these peak models is relatively consistently good, and that's what you'd expect for an isolated peak model. The only way noise could have an influence on these isolated peaks is really because of the background adjustments as a consequence of different noise at the start and end of these intervals. But other than that, the consistency that is achieved for the Voigt function is not achieved when we have correlated peaks and these SGL or GL line shapes, despite the same data reproduction for each one of these and the same stability with respect to the specific spectrum. That is to say, if these data are fitted with these peak models, then convergence has occurred. But once we introduce any noise, then the stability is not nearly so good if we've got an SGL or a GL line shape as if we've got a Voigt function. So Monte Carlo applied to these data certainly suggests there is a difference between when we choose a Voigt line shape and some of these pseudo Voigt line shapes. All three of these peak models are without parameter constraints other than interval parameter constraints and none of the parameters of position, full width, half maximum and area are up against the limits of these intervals. So effectively the parameters are free to move. The only property that differs between these peak models is the line shape. So the fact that we have a more stable peak model where we have these Voigt line shapes is a function of the line shape only. Now what we should also consider is that the influence of the line shape is interacting with the Monte Carlo calculation and causing this anomaly where the Voigt line shape seems to be artificially better than these other peaks. So I have another example, and this is a set of six measurements from polymethyl methacrylate. And what I can do is propagate these peak models and see how well they actually do against real data as opposed to simulated data as part of the Monte Carlo calculation. So let's start off by propagating the sum. So let me cascade these so I can see both files. So here we have two windows. This is the file that contains the six polymethyl methacrylate carbon 1s spectra. So I have all of these carbon 1s selected in the file that I wish to propagate to. So I need to right click over the sum Gaussian Lorentzian tile. And then I'm going to propagate without the Monte Carlo calculation the regions, the components, and also auto fit. So this will transfer this peak model to each of these selected VAMAS blocks and then fit the data. And now we see the peak model based on an SGL line shape that we can look at. And we can see that for the SGL line shape, let's just verify that the SGL line shape was indeed used and here it is. So yes, these fits have produced a range of different values for the correlated peaks. Right, let's do the same calculation but this time what we'll do is we'll now apply the propagation of the GL line shape. And again the GL line shape, these are indeed the GL40 line shapes, that these have produced a range of possible values yet again. So we can see the correlated peaks are moving even for these data that are acquired from real samples just at different times. So the random noise is different between these measurements. And that's exactly the type of simulation that the Monte Carlo is performing before fitting the peak models to calculate the uncertainties. So finally, we should apply the Voigt function. So I'm propagating the peak model with the Voigt functions. And this time for real data, applying the same peak model with the Voigt functions, we can see that the peak model is very stable. All these peaks have reproduced these peak areas with remarkable accuracy.
So the VoIP function does seem to be doing something different from the SGL and the GL line shapes. The next question we'll address is whether it's possible for these other peak models to produce a comparable stability to the VoIP functions and what we would have to do in terms of parameter constraints to make this possible. So I'll focus on this product Gaussian Lorentzian and I'll copy this to a new experiment frame so I can perform experiments on these data using this Gaussian Lorentzian peak model. I'll copy this again. So I've now got three different forms. And this will allow me to make some adjustments to the peak model in terms of these parameters. So if I bring up the quantification parameters dialog window and go to the components property page, I can then change the relationship between the fitting parameters. Since the arrangement for these data is very similar to the original data file, then one of the things I can do is use the TFF file, or in this case the SFF file, which was saved when the VAMAS file was saved, of the data file that contained the LA, SLG and GL line shapes. So when I select this using the load tile format dialog window, and say open, then I end up with a display and the display is identical to what I had before. The difference is that I've copied the same VAMAS block containing the product Gaussian Lorentzian line shapes. So this is how the data is displayed using that tile format file. And we can see the current state for all of these calculated uncertainties based on a peak model where the only constraint is the line shape. The other constraints in terms of area, full width half maximum and position are all allowed to vary. So what I'll do is I will alter the constraint fields within these peak models. So in the first one that I'm going to adjust, I'm going to make this so that the full width half maximum between peak A and peak B, that's the larger of these peaks and the one next to it, I'm going to enter A and press return and it will calculate the current relationship between column A and column B in terms of full width half maximum. So that represents a full width half maximum constraint between two correlated peaks. Now I can also use this third VAMAS block and rather than having a full width half maximum constraint, if I type A and press return, then in the position constraint, I now impose an offset between these two peaks. So the constraint that I've added to the peak model will be in terms of the full width half maximum between these two correlated peaks, whereas in the second of these two, the constraint is in terms of position. So let's now calculate the error bars that are associated with these. I need to remove these other tick boxes and tick the box that says component error bars. Check that I've got the right VAMAS block selected. It's difficult to tell with these names, but I believe this to be the case because these are the two that I've just adjusted. So I'll say OK. And once the Monte Carlo simulation has finished, we can see that after introducing a full width half maximum constraint, we have improved the error. However, in the case of the position, not quite so much. It is an improvement, but it's not quite as much as the full width half maximum. So by making use of Monte Carlo, we can experiment with different constraints and work out which constraints have the greatest influence on the stability of a peak model with respect to noise. And this is important because a peak model with constraints represents bias that has been introduced into the peak model. So the fewer constraints, the less bias. So what we would like to do is obtain the best stability with the fewest number of constraints.